25 new playable factions besides the four major ones. Who would have thought, right? We're gonna take a look at both the historical background, rosters and starting positions that we know of these factions. But before we get into that, tell me in the comments which faction are you excited for the most. It's time for some logic and yeah, <laughs> it's one of those days. Consider how huge this update actually is. I wouldn't expect any of the old original factions, any of those cultures, to get new custom units. There's so much work behind this update and it's just pure logic that all of the work is going towards the new parts of the map. These minor factions won't have access to unique court mechanics and commands and playing them will be challenging and that's a great idea. But they need to have at least a few units shared with the major factions, otherwise things won't be as exciting army-wise. If you have to rely on natives alone or being stuck with the same, I don't know, tier 3 or 4 units the whole game. There needs to be something exciting added to make you go, wow, I want to play the Phoenicians, for example, because they have a lot of interesting units and not just because of the position or history. Now with that out of the way, let's go. Nubia was famous for its wealth and the deadliness of its archers for millennia. Centered around the holy site of Jabal Barkal, Napata grew very prosperous. With the gradual weakening of Egyptian central rule in the centuries following the Bronze Age collapse, Napata gained independence and the Kingdom of Kush was centered around this area. From here, the conquest of Egypt happened and the 25th Nubian dynasty was established. Gradually, over the centuries, the power of Napata waned, and the political power got transferred to a new capital, Meroe, but Napata still remained a very powerful religious center. The Nubian native roster has some amazing ranged infantry, and the melee infantry can hold, but not as well. It's gonna need something from Amun Mess's roster, logically, just to be able to compete. Now, what will it get? That's the question. Historically, Nubians were great charioteers as well, so I wouldn't be surprised if they got something like Nubian chariots. Giving them Amun Mess's range units would be logical, because that actually gives you the incentive to play a minor faction more, otherwise they'll be completely outclassed, but that's part of the challenge. They don't have the best infantry though, so all you gotta do is go around the corner into Upper Egypt and get some amazing shock infantry as well as frontline, and hey, you know what? Actually deadly levies. The Napatan starting position is disgustingly easy, so first you're, you're in denial, <laughs> literally. You're surrounded by so much food and free resources, you just have to colonize this. Now, the only problem is I'm a mess, so you gotta take my boy out, you know, but if you do that, this is gonna be a face roll campaign. The Phrygians gradually settled Anatolia in the final period of the Bronze Age and eventually established a powerful kingdom on the ruins of the Hittite heartland, which eventually got destroyed by the Sumerians. The playable faction, the Sangarian Phrygians, are mentioned in the Iliad. They were allies of Troy, but they didn't fight in the war. However, they fought the Amazons with the help of King Priam. The Sangarian Phrygians will start on the new part of the map, considering the two currently existing Phrygian factions and Pharaoh already occupy a lot of territory and just, you know, it's a great opportunity for some uh, new management. There are so many Phrygian units in the game already, so you can bet that they'll add all of them, even Kurunta's Phrygian units. The veterans are insane infantry, the regular mercenaries are too, grey javelins, cheap spearmen, what's not to like? Well, you don't have archers, which sucks, but at least you can fix that with natives to the west. The blog mentions no defensive units, but my brother and Kuvava, look around you, you're in Anatolia. You can get such tanky infantry in the lowlands and Isuwa, it doesn't matter if their killing power is not as good as the Phrygians, they just need to hold the line and you can even have chariots if you want to. The Cimmerians, the first tyrannic steppe nomads that terrorized the settled kingdoms of old arrive about four to five centuries early. After fighting in countless battles as mercenaries against all the neighboring kingdoms such as Urartu, Assyria and the different Neo-Hittites, they eventually settle in Anatolia after destroying the Phrygian Kingdom. 
When it comes to their starting position, they're either gonna follow the historical route and settle in Anatolia, so we can expect to see them in the newer expanded parts of Anatolia, perhaps in the north, or we're gonna see them closer to the Zagros Mountains. Unit-wise, cavalry, do I need to say more? It's questionable how many different unique units they'll have, but it's obvious to expect horse archers and elite cavalry. But what about the weak infantry roster? Listen, they are putting in some effort into Cimmeria, but it's not a major faction. If we're not getting new infantry models, they're adding native units. Look at Anatolia. Anything but a weak frontline, you just have tanky, durable units, you have some of the most cost-efficient Axemen in the game, renowned Isu-1 Axemen and regular Isu-1 Axemen. Ranged, levies, what more do you want? Oh, I know, you want shock infantry so you can just get the Highlands, you get amazing Kashkin Raiders, amazing Javelins, you still have tanky frontline and you got a very effective low-tier shock. What more do you want? The only downside is their lack of good archers in this area, but that's a problem that solves itself once you expand into the new areas of the map, or you know what, hey, go and invade Nubia, man, you're an adult, you can make your own choices. Just a quick note before we look at the history of the Greek minor factions, let's be real here. This isn't even speculation, they've said it themselves, a lot of historical units are directly coming from Total War Troy. There are just so many units in that game, it's pretty much a given that most will make it in one way or another, both as faction and native units, and some of them will probably be renamed to fit with the historical theme. Even if the Aegean factions are mainly based on the Iliad, it seems. Now, we're gonna have to wait and find out the exact units, but having a lot of axes and javelins will definitely be a thing for the natives. Boeotia was home to many important cities of the Bronze Age, such as Orchomenos and Thebes, which was well known beyond the Aegean. A rich and important kingdom during the Bronze Age of Greece, it was even known in Egypt. Thebes even traded with Babylon, through proxies. Many archaeological finds show that it was a big power. Roster-wise, it seems like a standard Greek faction balanced both in defense and offense based on the blog, but lacking in strong ranged. Now, you know what you gotta do to fix that. Bronze Age Thessaly, or Aeolia as it was known, has many archaeological sites from west to east, as an example, Pteleon and Iolcos. Thessaly had extensive trade contacts with its southern neighbors, and many Tolos tombs as well as other sites show the cultural link, but there are missing pieces of the puzzle for this region in the Bronze Age compared to some of its more prominent neighbors. Achilles' birthplace is Thessaly, and the name is already documented in Linear B as Achilleo, so I wouldn't be surprised if he was the faction leader here. In Troy, he had an amazing aggressive roster, and that lines up with what the blog says. Few defensive units? My brother and Zeus, you're in Greece, just take a look around. Sometimes you don't need a defense, you know, if you just kill them before they kill you, and I'm pretty sure Achilles will have great units. I don't even need to talk about the Myrmidons and how broken they were, but assuming they're back here, renamed, you can expect Achilles to basically be unstoppable. Aegean runners were amazing flanking light infantry, and they were just so fun to use. Heavy swordsmen, pelagic, Thessalians, just in general I really love the Achilles roster. If he gets anything from his own Troy roster added to the game, you can expect to easily crush your enemies and see them driven before you. While we don't have any historical character that can be identified with Ithaca or Odysseus in the late Bronze Age, it's undeniable that it was a part of the Greek culture of this time, and it's not a stretch to say that this area was involved in trading with the West Mediterranean. Certainly a part of the Ionian Sea Islanders were among the Sea People confederations that raided the Eastern Mediterranean during the collapse, and there's even a theory that the Sheridan originated from the islands of West Greece. Speaking of which, you're gonna call me crazy and, you know, be right as always, but I guarantee you we'll see some Sea People units in Odysseus' roster. Since they're taking the Iliad and, well, in this case, Odyssey liberties, there's the Egyptian raid of Odysseus from the Odyssey. The question is, which Sea People units are we getting? 
The lack of chariots is gonna be a big issue, but as always you can fix that with natives. It doesn't matter if you become the Vanax of Greece or the Pharaoh. But this year's roster in Troy mainly focused on aggressive short-range skirmishing with awesome javelins, ambushers basically, great infantry such as the Warriors of Ithaca and even Midnight Runners were a fun unit to use. Considering the blog says great range, I can definitely see some of his unique javelins being added and potentially sea people archers or something like that. During the Bronze Age, the different tribes of Thrace frequently traded and raided their Greek neighbors as many archaeological finds show. Now unfortunately for us, we don't have any written contemporary accounts, but for what it's worth we have the Iliad where they appear as Trojan allies. And some of them uh, gloriously get killed in their sleep, including their king, Rhesus. The Thracians have a huge roster in Troy, and it's confirmed Rhesus is the faction leader. Now, look at all these awesome units. It's basically questionable what they're gonna pour into Pharaoh. I wouldn't be surprised if we see most, if not everything, from this. Such as the amazing devoted to Zalmoxis, which were essentially shock spearmen that could even go berserk when low health or something extremely fun like their chariots. You want savage barbarians and animal skin? Say hello to the warriors of Pangaion, or worshippers of Pan. Any roster weaknesses the Thracians might have will easily be solved with native units, so just go wild and experiment. I mean, hey, it's that time of the year. Lycia was the homeland of the Luca, or Lucawani in their own language. Alluvian people who were subjects of the Hittites and, you know, from time to time their enemies. They even served at the Battle of Kadesh. The Luka already appear in-game from the very start and have their own Sea People units, but Lycia seems to be settled and drawn from the Iliad once again. So we're looking at the return of Sarpedon and his roster, surely. Strong chariots are mentioned as one of their strengths, and remember Lycian winged chariots from Troy? I loved this unit so much. Lycia had a diverse and deadly melee roster in Troy. All the axe units are basically monsters, and don't even get me started on the cost efficiency of the Kupesh and renowned Kupesh fighters. Now, the ranged weakness? I really find hard to believe that, considering Lycia had some great ranged units in Troy. Maybe they'll return as native units? There's a high chance we'll see them come back, considering the fact that Asua needs to have a big and healthy native roster to compete with its neighbors. Also, let's ignore the fact that it's pretty easy to predict the core Trojan roster, so the other factions aligned with them from that old game? They're definitely gonna see their units return. Sitnacht, the founder of the 20th dynasty, the father of Ramses III. He took the Egyptian throne in a bloody civil war which saw him defeat the last pharaoh of the 19th dynasty, Tausret, and her ally, Irsu, ejecting the Canaanites and bringing back the stability to the land. Unfortunately, he didn't get to rule long, but he left a good legacy for his son, Ramses III, who made it even greater. So we don't know exactly which Egyptian units he'll get, but it's a safe bet that he'll have something from his son Ramses, as well as Upper, Lower Egypt, and maybe some of the other Egyptian factions. One great thing about him is that he has an insane access from the start to the Libu roster. Amazing ranged infantry, cost-efficient shock units, and if you're fighting on desert, It'll be great. The lack of chariots is honestly a huge weakness, but you know what? Just become Pharaoh. Problem solved. Oh, and Upper and Lower Egypt have chariots, but we don't care about those. Sutnakte has the potential to be an absolute monster on the campaign, so first things first, he's the closest to the Aegean and Greece, so you know, if you want to do a reverse Ptolemaic dynasty, <laughs> that's a great chance. Now, to the south, you got a bunch of ruined settlements you can easily garrison for special resources, and you have easy access to the Nile Delta. So, if you want to rush for the Pharaoh title, it's very easy to get legitimacy as well. The only annoying part about this, you'll constantly fight swarms of Libyan invaders during the crisis. Overall, though, it's irrelevant if you got, like, one defensive army or just garrisons. This has the potential to be an insanely strong campaign. 
Imagine becoming Pharaoh just because your father, Ramses II, outlived all your brothers and you'll die in a few years. Feels good being Merneptah, doesn't it? But he did great victories for Egypt too, such as the Battle of Perire where he crushed the Sea People and Libyan hordes. He also crushed many Canaanite rebellions. He's the Pharaoh, the big daddy, so you can expect him to have the best of the best units. He'll definitely share elites with his son Seti, that's like undeniable, but probably with the other Egyptian major factions as well, like Taustret and Ramses, and obviously Amun Mes. The blog mentions the weakness of no low tier infantry, but my brother in Ra, you're in Lower Egypt. Look how many levies you can just send to die for the Pharaoh's will. Merneptah is an interesting choice, so basically you start with an amazing province and you have vassals covering your west bank. Food is never gonna be an issue. The special resources though... I guess you can always revoke your vassals' uh, right to exist. You do have some room to expand, but essentially you're as safe as you can get. Now, will you slog through the pain and agony that is Egypt, or will you go towards the Mediterranean? It's kind of your choice, you know. Bakharia and Dungul are Libyan factions, and their native roster is already fully in the game and is just so good. Great high tier ranged units, insanely efficient shock units, great javelins, cheap levies just to send to die. You know what? It's a pretty good roster overall. Especially if you're fighting in sand and during sandstorms. The question is, will they get any Egyptian units added to their roster? Now, historically, many Libyans from the west settled into Egypt and served in the army, so with full Egyptian equipment. It wouldn't be surprising if they got some Egyptian units, but in the case they don't, Upper Egypt is always around the corner and you know what that means. Dungul kinda has an interesting start, so you're basically all alone here in the middle of nowhere. You've got so many cities you can colonize. You've got Buchen here, which is an insane food province, there's also stone, and you got easy access with that to the Nile, North Nubia, and Upper Egypt. Essentially, the annoying thing is gonna be your core roster, because a lot of them just can't compete with some of their Egyptian counterparts, and you're gonna be constantly raided by the Libu, we assume, even if you're one of them. Bakharia actually has the potential to be a difficult campaign, so unlike the other Libu, you're not isolated. You're directly next to Merneptah's vassals, you got Sitnacht, and sure, you got a bunch of good resource provinces you can colonize, but they're still gonna be bordering potentially hostile invasions. This is gonna be hard, cause all the Egyptian factions are united here, but if you can break through, or go to the north, you can get easy access to the Mediterranean and the Nile Delta. Byblos, one of the most powerful Phoenician cities kept close ties with Egypt for centuries, is one of their main exporters of cedar wood, among other goods. During the Amarna period of the 14th century, the city is well known for its governor, Rib Adi, who basically spammed the pharaoh Akhenaten with letters and cries for help. The pharaoh was pretty annoyed with a constant chat spam, so he sent him a letter back which said, Why do you alone keep writing to me? Now, unfortunately, our good friend Rib Adi is eventually captured and executed, but this does give us an insight into the political situation of Canaan during the 14th century and the pure chaos. However, Byblos would continue as a prosperous city for centuries to come. When it comes to the native Fenhu roster, we have great medium chariots, very tanky infantry, amazing archers, and not too shabby low tiers. But this is where things get interesting. According to the blog, Byblos takes a page out of the Carthage book, or better said, Carthage takes from its predecessors and hires mercenaries, in this case, Sea People mercenaries. The Sea People roster is just absolutely insane. I don't want to imagine what this faction will do if it has renowned seafaring raiders, or god forbid, islander raiders, or marauding axe chargers. This might just be the strongest and the easiest of the minor factions. 
Biblos is just amazing. So you're in a great area. There's so much food and special resources. Obviously, Kanan has a lot of them spread around. And across the water, look what we have. We have a ton of bronze on Cyprus. So there's one big problem here. You're still going to be very exposed to sea people invasions, but if you can rush Bay as soon as he moves to Hazor and get rid of Irsu, this is going to be a face roll of a campaign. Ugarit, the city of the White Harbor, a city of amazing weaponsmiths that forged high quality swords for multiple kings and pharaohs, even Merneptah himself. One of the most important trading hubs of the time. Historically, Ugaritic texts give us mentions of all layers of Canaanite society when it comes to military, from the Hupshu force recruited peasants to the professional Sabu Najib and the Marianu nobles. Now, logically, this means they should get some scraps from <laughs> Irsu's table because, come on, 2 and 2 equals 4, so this would make a great gameplay experience. The blog mentions that weak flanking options exist, but come on, anything can be on flanker. But realistically, you're very close to Sinai and Rechenu natives, so you can use the Abiru Raiders as an example, or the Abiru Mercenaries. Very cost efficient and very deadly. Do you like action and being right in the middle of things? So Ugarit is gonna be the perfect campaign. It starts off with a great city that has an amazing, unique building, the White Harbor. Right across, there's Cyprus and all the bronze you could want. You got the Hittite lands, you've got the rest of Canaan with its amazing special resources. If you go east after Imar, it'll be Mesopotamia, so the world is your oyster, basically. Are you exposed to invasion? Yes, you are. Can you defend it? Don't even question it, easily. Ashkelon, a Canaanite commercial center was under Egyptian dominion for a long time until the Bronze Age collapse, where eventually the Peleset moved in and established it as one of their main cities of the so-called Pentapolis. It suffers from the same problem of the Canaanite native rosters being too close, and it isn't bad, but it's gonna need something extra added to make you want to play with them. A different mix of Bey and Irsus units would be logical, perhaps maybe even a few Egyptian units for variety's sake, but the question is which? The blog talks about mostly low tiers, but it doesn't specify, and a lot of the low tiers in Pharaoh are actually great. They just need to pick some interesting units, otherwise the campaign could get very stale, composition-wise. Ashkelon has a very interesting start. So at first look, the city is tier 4, and that's great. All the provinces around you are so rich. All special resources you need. There's food, there's gold, there's stone. Now, there's kind of a big problem. <laughs> so you're exposed to the sea people from here. Ramses is easily gonna crush the Canaanites here and come up next to you, and you also have the Palisade right from the start. So, if you can navigate through the early game, the sheer amount of wealth you'll be able to have with this faction will easily just snowball you. But it is just a potentially tricky start. Damascus, or Dimascu, wasn't as prominent as the other playable Canaanites during this time. Many battles were fought in the late Bronze Age in this area, but its true rise to power came with the collapse and the subsequent Aramean migration. They took over the area and established a powerful kingdom known to us as Aram Damascus. The faction is mentioned as ambush heavy, and guess what? Base right next door with an ambush heavy playstyle, so 2 and 2 sometimes equals 4, apparently. <laughs> Bay has amazing ambushers in his entire roster. It's not a question of will they get it, the question is what will they get? The lack of frontline is easily solved if you expand just a bit into Fenhu and Yamcha, then who knows what awaits in Mesopotamia. So, you want to play the mask or huh? There's kind of a big problem with that. Irsu wants to bash your brains in right from the start. If you manage to beat him, though, this province, you already control three cities, and it's insane because you got gold and food. You're completely protected from this side of the map, because this will not get added with the expansion. You only have to worry about this area. To the south, you can pick off the vulnerable Canaanites. You've got so much resources, it's just insane. 
if you actually want to play an ambush focused faction and be protected from here and have an easier access to Mesopotamia, why not just survive the early game nightmare that's known as Irsu? Imar was another glorious commercial center connecting Mesopotamia with the West until its destruction by the Sea People. Their native Sinai and Rechenu unit roster is pretty great with great medium chariots, decent aggressive infantry, cost-efficient archers, and some very cheap awesome shock. But that's boring and just ain't enough for a variety. If we're talking about shock, Irsu has a bunch of shock units, Bey has a bunch of shock units, so the question is, what'll they get? About the range, the weakness, on the faction roster, sure, but the native roster is good enough, and you know what, Fenhu and Yamhad are just around the corner, so is Mesopotamia. Imar is gonna be good if you want basically just about immediate access into Mesopotamia here. Now, you have a bunch of other minor factions, you have Irsu to the south, you have the Hittites to the north. Do you want to fight them? Sure, it's up to you. You've got a great resources all around, and Mesopotamia is just around the corner, so this could be a very fun starting position. Alashia, located on the east coast of Cyprus, was one of the most important trade hubs of the world, connecting both east and west Mediterranean, and beyond, through proxies. It was infamous for its sheer amount of copper, and we know how important that is for bronze making. So the blog states that they have a mixture of Canaanite and Hittite units, but here's the problem with that. We don't have a clue what possible Hittite units they could get. It could be something as insignificant as spearmen or good like the Hittite axemen. The native roster of the area is shared with the other coastal Canaanites, which is good in its own, but here's the thing. It's boring, and there's a much more interesting option. There's a Greek settlement on the west of the island, Paphos. The culture is Greek there too, so it would make more sense if Alasha had access to Aegean units. We know there was a heavy Aegean presence on the island, both as permanent merchant settlements and sometimes as hostile raiders. This would just be so much more fun than giving them the standard Fenhu units. Do you wanna swim in bronze? Cause that's essentially what this starting position is. Also, coastal settlements means you have no problem with food. You can expand anywhere you want, the world is your oyster, you wanna go for the... Mediterranean here? Why not, you know, you can make your own choices. But here's the problem. So you're on the island, it's super defendable, right? But it's a hot spot for sea people invasion. And the other factions, they're gonna want a piece of that bronze, so you better be ready for permanent fighting. But what else is new, right? Karchemish boasts a royal heritage, with the king sharing blood with one of the greatest Hittite kings, Shupiluluma I. But it wasn't always in Hittite hands, just like the nearby Malidia. Both were important cities of the kingdom of Mitanni, once a great enemy of the Hittites before they succeeded in conquering most of the land. But just as the Hittites conquered the Hurrians, so did the Hurrian influence spread amongst the Hittites. Karchemish was prosperous and managed to survive the Bronze Age collapse despite apparently being on the list of destroyed areas by the Sea People. With the fall of Hattusha, Karchemish viewed itself as a direct successor of the royal line and even subjugated Malidia for a time. Ramses III campaigned against Karchemish and it still continued as a strong Neo-Hittite kingdom in the Iron Age. Eventually, both Karchemish and Malidia would be subjugated by the Neo-Assyrians. The blog mentions the best of the best Hittite chariots, so it's kind of obvious he's gonna get the main Shupiluluyuma roster chariots, which are just monsters. The lack of good enough frontline doesn't really matter, because once again, you're in Isuwa, we know how good these units are. When it comes to Malidia, on the blog they say aggressive roster with no missile infantry, so that definitely means they're a budget Kurunta. You can expect some of the aggressive shock units, and for the ranged units, you're just gonna have to pray for some decent natives in Mesopotamia. The new Hittite starting position basically comes down to whose roster you prefer, cause they're gonna have a staring contest with each other right from the start. You desperately want each other's land. Do you want easy access into Mesopotamia? Both give you that. Now the question is, do you want to bother with Canaan and the West? Go Karchemish. Do you want to bother a little bit more with the hinterlands? Go Melidia, or you know what, don't care about that, just go south and kill him. 
It's your call. So, before we get into Mesopotamia, we basically have no idea what they're gonna do for native units. It's not as clear-cut as the Aegean, as an example. But I can tell you from a historical perspective what you can expect before we get into the historical backgrounds of the factions. Before any professional military reforms that happened, like, let's say, in the Neo-Assyrian period, most of the Akkadians were essentially farmer levies backed up with an elite royal corps. You can expect a lot of sickle swords as well, because this region is the home of the sickle sword. As seen on the Vulture Stell, for example, we have the king wielding a very early version of the sword. And this is dated to the 3rd millennium BC. Should probably expect a good amount of shock units as well, considering the many savage tribesmen of the hills and mountains of the north. Now, let's take a look at the factions. The Shutu or Sutians were famous raiders and mercenaries since the times of old, alongside their Alamu cousins. Even the great king of Amorite Babylon, Hammurabi, used them. They were hired across all the areas, from Mesopotamia, through Syria, and even South Canaan. In the Amarna letters, they're even mentioned as mercenaries serving under the Egyptian-aligned king of Damascus. Their Aramean cousins are far more famous in pop culture and historical impact, so I'll be surprised if the majority of the Sutian roster doesn't consist of Arameans. At least the later game. If we're going by accuracy here, they'll definitely have great ambushers and raiding units in general that excel fighting in the desert. Now, one thing that's amazing about this faction, and this is just, you know, personal bias, camels. Camel cavalry is my favorite type of units in Total War games. Every Total War they feature in, I just love them. The Scare Horses debuff is already in Pharaoh, so you can bet camels are gonna be useful against the upcoming cavalry units. Minus 8 leadership and the goofy animal? <laughs> What's not to like? Shubartu was once a part of the Kingdom of Mitanni, before its eventual destruction by the Hittites. In the Late Bronze Age, Shubartu and the neighboring area was conquered by the Middle Assyrian Empire. It retained a strong Hurrian element, as personal names and worshipped gods like Teshub further support this, even into the Iron Age. It was also a melting pot of other cultures, as Hittites, different tribes of the former Hayashazi, later on in the Iron Age, Arameans, and other peoples lived in Shubartu. The kingdom successfully rebelled against Assyria and proved to be a sort of a buffer zone in the Iron Age between the kingdom of Urartu and the Neo-Assyrian Empire, sometimes changing hands or simply remaining independent until its final conquest by Assyria. So the blog is pretty clear here, heavy Hittite defenders, so we can expect elite Hittite spearmen, because what else is a defender, right? Medium Mesopotamian flankers, now we have no idea about the upcoming Mesopotamian units. But considering there's a lot of so-called barbarians around this area, I wouldn't just be surprised if they were like, I don't know, clubmen or something. The lack of ranged can be a problem. If Shubru is starting closer to Anatolia, the Anatolian ranged isn't exactly good. Mesopotamia, and you can have an uh, educated guess that they will be better, so once again it's gonna boil down to having to actually conquer a good region to recruit good natives. Parts of the Shubru could either be at the very north of the new map update, or a little bit closer to Mesopotamia, so technically they'll be safe from one of their sides. The Lulubi are well known to the people of Mesopotamia. Described as savage barbarians of the mountains, the Lulubi are shown defeated on the victory stele of Naram Sin dated to the late 3rd millennium BC. Over the centuries, they would frequently rebel and raid the different ruling powers of the general Mesopotamian area. They were never a fully unified people. The Lulubi had many different chieftains and kings, but their name would be applied to all the barbarians from the mountains. Even the Urartians had a hostile term for them. We don't know their exact origin, and what little linguistic evidence we have is, uh, nowhere near conclusive. The Lulubi were famed for their quarrelsome nature and, basically, aggression, so their roster would certainly have powerful shock units. But which part of the map would they come from? 
Large confederations were recorded in the Zagros Mountains, so this is a realistic scenario. You can descend southward and burn Babylon to the ground because, hey, you know, they've had it coming for a good thousand years or so. The lack of mounted units? Yeah, that's a monstrous weakness, but at least you have easy access to natives in the south, so do with that what you will. Elam has way too much history as the oldest civilization on the Iranian plateau to be put in one video. At least not this one, so don't worry, that'll come soon enough. When it comes to late Bronze Age Elam, they were frequently involved with Kassite Babylon. Diplomatical marriages between the royal families ensued peace for a time. But the Elamites fought many successful wars against Babylon, even sacking the city and carrying off the statues of the gods such as Marduk. To the people of Babylon, this was unimaginable, the ultimate insult. Eventually, Elam would destroy the Kassites for good and end their royal line. But violence didn't stop there. They fought frequent wars against Neo-Assyria and supported multiple rebellions of the Chaldeans. Eventually, Elam was crushed by the Assyrians in the very late Iron Age and shattered into smaller vassal kingdoms. When it comes to warfare, the Elamites were famous for the swordsmanship and archery of the elite, as well as the savagery of the many tribes of the hinterlands. I'd expect a very diverse roster here, but the lack of elite infantry in the blog makes no sense. If anything, they absolutely should have at least one or two units that can match Assyria and Babylon. The Elamites were a power player for a reason. The starting position is probably going to be one of the safest in the game, considering you're right at the end of the map with nothing to threaten you. And as soon as you expand into Mesopotamia, enjoy all the food you can eat. Assyria has way too much history to be put in this specific video, and I've already done one which covers the most noticeable exploits of the Neo-Assyrians in a little bit of a shorter time frame. So for some reason, the main Assyrian faction is minor and Hanigalbat is major. Now, let me give you some historical insight here. During the Assyrian times, Hanigalbat was the center of another branch of the royal family and the seat of the Sukal Urabiu, an important administrative official of the court, basically. If they wanted to show Ninurta Apal Ekur's rise to power, that's a great idea. But from what we've seen, this is completely Neo-Assyrian and has nothing Hurrian in influence. If the game started like over a hundred years ago, we could see the actual Kingdom of Mitanni with their supposed Indo-Aryan ruling elite and Hurrian population. Their military tactics, the Marianu system of warfare, basically defined the Middle East of the Bronze Age when it comes to chariots. It was a great option to explore them at an earlier star date, but now, from what we've seen on the blog, this is basically gonna be just the Neo-Assyria. If we get any low-tier Hurin units, that'll be crazy in a good way, but don't hold your breath. As for the Assyria Minor, it's just gonna be a weaker version in every way possible, so if you just wanna have the fancy Assyria tag, I guess that's the reason you're gonna wanna play it. Well, there you go, we're finally at the end, and I don't know if you're still alive after this video, hats off to you, you're a real trooper. I hope you've enjoyed learning about some of the minor factions in the game, the overview on the starting positions. As always, we love history here. It took a lot of time to make this, so honestly, any support is appreciated, any likes, shares, or subbing if you're crazy enough. You know what? I appreciate it, really. There's going to be a lot more new content coming, so stay tuned. And until the next time...